Yeah, so, uh, good morning, all. Uh, it's great pleasure to be alive now. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to bring in to you two distinguished speakers uh, from industry and government today in this inaugural session of STPI Pulse. Uh, STPI Pulse is the knowledge series for transformative ideation. Uh, given the challenging situation of pandemic COVID-19, which has engulfed the entire world and has posed serious challenges for the health and economic security of millions of people worldwide, you know, given that we are probably in the midst of certain kind of recession, right? There is there was a need for coming, you know, online and talking about you know deliberating and hearing from the leaders who have seen, uh, you know, in past various you know experiences through uh, through their own journey. Uh, today's session will deliberate upon uh, overcoming the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis in particular for IT, ITS, and MSMEs and startups. So we'll try to focus more on this segment of our industry. I'm sure uh, the introduction, uh, there is no need for introduction as such, uh, but let me still introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Shri Shubhito Bakshi. Uh, Shri Shubhito Bakshi is co-founder of Mindtree. Uh, the global IT solutions and company, and currently chairman Odisha Skill Development Authority, Government of Odisha. He is also heading heading IEC team, constituted to undertake various activities to spread awareness for containing COVID-19. Uh, Shri Bakshi is also chief spokesperson of Odisha Government uh, on COVID-19. Uh, from very humble beginnings, uh, he went on to achieve extraordinary professional success by co-founding Mindtree, one of the India's most admired software services companies. Besides being a successful Indian entrepreneur and business leader, Mr. Bakshi is also known as a very accomplished author. And I'm sure people like me who have read his work, books like Go Kiss the World or High Performance Entrepreneur, a lot of people in the audience would have also you know, read his, uh, his books. Uh, my second speaker is uh, Dr. Umkar Rai, is Director General uh, Software Technology Parks of India, a premier government organization working for the promotion of the IT, ITS industry in India. Dr. Rai has contributed immensely in repositioning STPI with focus on innovation and dispersal of the IT industry beyond metros. Uh, with over 25 years of experience in the industry, in the sector, uh, with unique distinct, distinction of enabling close coordination of working of government and industry. I think that's the hallmark uh, we have seen in his leadership where STPI has become very, very close to the industry altogether. He has been instrumental in formulating various interfaces for the industry, academia, and you know, and various associations. Uh, recently, uh, in with a focus on building vibrant pan-India tech entrepreneurship and startup ecosystem, we have seen new initiatives inside STPI under him, such as Center of Excellence in Emerging Technologies, uh, Next Generation Incubation Scheme, Mighty Startup Hub, IBPS, NEPPS scheme, you know, and there are many more such initiatives uh, which we STPI has taken. Right. Uh, to further, uh, now I think I'll initially uh, uh, invite Dr. Rai for his opening thoughts, and then we'll switch over to keynote speaker uh, session from uh, Sri Shubhato Bakshi. So, sir, uh, for you. Thank you, Subhas Uh Good morning to all of you. Uh, my, uh, you know. Gratitude to Sri Shubhato Bhagji himself, who is going to be the maiden speaker, opening our inaugural speaker in this first uh, webinar of STPI named as STPI Pulp. And as you can, uh, can see from the name itself that STPI has started this knowledge webinar series to, to ensure that STPI and other stakeholders, uh, primarily industry and government, we get the pulse of the thing happening around us. And therefore, it was in fitness of things to, to rope in such a great speaker who is not only experienced in, in the government, but also has been a founder of such a fantastic IT services company in this country, known for his uh, you know, uh, uh, contribution in terms of being an author, philanthropist, ideator, most uh, importantly, a very compassionate person who thinks, who who looks at uh, the things around him, and takes initiative to you know meet the challenges, to mitigate issues and challenges, problems around him, and therefore uh, we are very grateful to him uh, that he consented uh, to be the maiden speaker despite his busy schedule. As you know that uh, he is the chief spokesperson for even government of Odisha and. Nowadays, uh, his uh, uh, bulletins are uh, 
very uh, eagerly awaited by the audience, uh, not only within Odisha, but by Odias from all over the world. And therefore, uh, he is also heading the Skill uh, Development Authority of uh, Odisha, which is doing pioneering work in terms of bridging the gap between uh, the you know uh, manpower and, and skill and the industry. Uh, we had uh, some uh, fortune of collaborating with him on certain projects, and therefore uh, he was. It was nice that he consented to be the maiden speaker for this very inaugural webinar series of TPI. We know that uh, pandemic uh, uh, COVID-19 has uh, presented us with the great challenge. And all over the world, uh, the people, the industries, the enterprises are uh, struggling to cope with this kind of challenge. Uh, within this country also, because of the la lockdown, uh, the IT industry, which is a uh, 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 very manpower intensive industry, mostly having the customers from Europe and US, uh, it's outsourcing industry. Uh, obviously, it is also facing great challenge. And at the same time, uh, the IT industry, because of uh, obvious reason, because it's so innovative, and therefore uh, the IT industry al is also coming forward with ideas, solutions, and and suggestions to to not only mitigate the challenges, but also to you know uh, capitalize on these uh, challenging times and come up with solution which can benefit the society at large and can also present a great opportunity to the entrepreneurs to come up with the innovative products. Uh, and therefore, uh, the IT industry is fast adopting to in the, to and resorting to the measures to mitigate these challenges that are presented in front of them. And at the same time, the governments of the day, like uh, central government and the state governments, uh, are, are, are very proactive in understanding the issues. And they have taken a number of initiatives, including uh, you know declaring the IT industry as a critical industry, allowing the movement of people who are uh, required to man the critical infrastructure of these IT industries. The administration, the police authorities are advised with the state government to be be very uh, you know considerate to the IT industry and to be proactive in uh, solving their problem. Uh, you also know that uh, the uh, Union government, uh, Minister of Commerce, Minister of Electronics and IT, Department of Revenues, Reserve Bank of India, which are primarily responsible for uh, regulating the export from this country and facilitating the IT industry within India, have been very, very proactive. As TPA itself, uh, even before the lockdown was announced on 12th of March itself, issued a notification facilitating uh, the work from home. Uh, followed by you know extension of uh, the foreign trade policy for another year, uh, notification of the Reserve Bank of India, uh, allowing uh, extension of time for export proceed realization, and at the same time, uh, uh, the the custom department Department of Revenue has uh, kindly agreed to you know honor and respect uh, all the emails that are issued by the government authorities as a valid document and therefore uh, we have tried to make sure that the you know the it industry as far as possible works without any hindrance without any interruption and therefore uh, the kind of uh, during this lockdown period stpi has been able to you know issue 27 licenses uh, uh, new registrations of stpi units with 65 renewals and uh, the the kind of software export Proceed that has been certified uh, by STPI uh, is is in the tune of uh, uh, fourteen thousand crore rupees with twenty five hundred such numbers software certification. So we have tried to work. We have also tried to serve the you know IT industry, small and medium entrepreneurs with the uh, eight uh, hundred twenty six uh, you know bandwidth customers, and that is why we have been. Uh, able to you know ensure 24 by 7 functional functionality within stpi primarily to you know uh, serve the it industry as such and therefore uh, uh, it's important uh, for us to you know share to share this kind of initiative to the industry and not only to inform and share what we are doing but also to sensitize them so that they can come forward and seek more from us and that is how we will be able to you know uh, decide and consider all those requirements 
in even in times to come you know that uh, the government of india during this lockdown period has been become has been very very innovative and it can be seen from the fact that uh, uh, arogya setu uh, app has been launched uh, very quickly uh, government instant manage, ma ma messaging solution gems it has been launched by you know the government uh, the ministry of electronics and it has also launched innovation challenge for video conferencing solution for indigenous solution we have we are seeking the entrepreneurs the startup to come up with the ideas and the best product will be you know supported by the government stpi has also launched has already conducted safe india hackathon challenge uh, primarily to seek solutions from the entrepreneurs and the startups uh, which can work for the covid 19 uh, solutions and uh, you will be very happy that 546 applications were received 100 uh, 56 uh, you know applications were shortlisted and finally we have been able to you know choose 10 such startups uh, who are offering solutions around ventilators isolation tools and uh, and creating such other solutions which can help mitigate this covid 19 problem so we have uh, i mean all the stakeholders are trying their bit uh, trying their best to you know meet the challenges uh, to to maintain the activity to to collaborate with the stakeholders if it is not physical then it is digital collaboration and uh, in these times uh, therefore it's very important that we collaborate and i am very happy that uh, uh, sri subhato bagchi has consented to you know guide us to to steer us through to 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 allow the you know participate in this uh, air meet conference to ask questions and seek his views uh, i must say that i am personally very grateful stpi is uh, uh, very grateful to sri subhato bagchi and he has been very nice to stpi for a long time he he always uh, you know extends all his support uh, to us and therefore uh, uh, with these few words i must say that uh, uh, it's time for uh, sri subhato bagchi to address us thank you sir i think uh, i uh, know uh, uh, there are very uh, interesting points which you raise and i'm sure we will take this up uh, in a q and a uh, but before that i invite uh, sri shubhato bakshi first of all uh, sri rai and uh, sri shubhot uh, manas here thank you very much for uh, asking me to come and and uh, it is a pleasure and a privilege every time to come back to the stpi family uh, which is my family and uh, i always say that the it industry wouldn't be where it is today without stpi and its pioneering role and i'm always delighted to see that the stpi rises to every single challenge as it comes so thank you for having me here i will start my conversation with all the attendees here by looking i think we are facing uh, some network issues looks like from his end um, yeah. uh, so we can request uh, sri bakshi to start again yeah i i am just asking right yeah. yes yeah so uh, while i think uh, uh, sir uh we we will uh, wait for uh, mr bakshi to connect back uh, i think uh, there were a couple of things which you sir spoke about especially in the form of you know the government's intervention and how the government has been very very proactive in supporting industry right besides that i think one very important point you start touched upon is the way the government is now seeking solutions right uh, so is do you think you know this kind of you know public private partnership model right where government has developed an application called arogya setu for looking forward forward for solution in video messaging is that something which is you know uh, which is the need of an hour not for because of the child, the crisis which has come right now 
but more because you know that's the best probably a way to get innovative solutions of course see the point is that uh, it's uh, like uh, it's uh, all proven well proven that whenever there are challenges uh, the society nation and people at large meet those challenges and while meeting those challenges uh, they develop certain things so this challenge uh, has uh, actually presented this opportunity and india has grabbed this challenge because you know that uh, for i think uh, uh, audience oh it's okay so india was in a position to you know grab and quickly you know address these challenges because because uh, a very strong it services industry of india having a lot of mentors experts who can develop products and all and therefore uh, you can see that very quickly you know the product like arogya shruti were not only developed but they have been launched uh, you know that video uh, solution uh, which uh, nic has just launched for government uh, video was also a, a, a work of private uh, partnership with the government this uh, this uh, indigenous video conference solution uh, challenge that has been launched by the government with a view to you know seek the private participation uh, in 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 developing indigenous solution which can be used by the country at large uh, we are also whatever uh, we are doing uh, to identify and uh, shortlist uh, these startup actually they are private people and once they they develop their products uh, the whole nation including the government is going to use so it's not public private partnership i would say that it's like a private uh, uh, leadership entrepreneurship which is uh, which would be consumed by government without being the stakeholder so ppp is uh, one thing i mean ppcp is one when uh, we we also have equity or stake in the whole thing whereas uh, the model which uh, right now is uh, in place or in operation is uh, is about uh, uh, seeking uh, the people entrepreneurs startup to come and solve the problems and by solving the problem let them become leaders creators or let them become the product creator and then let them become the entrepreneur so i will uh, conclude my uh, you know uh, uh, answer because i guess that uh, sri subhuto bakshi is going to be live now and uh, we, i will have to hand uh, you know uh, mic to him basically so i can see he is going just going to be uh, uh, like yes So let him first uh, uh, complete, and then we'll we'll let. Correct. His mic is off. Yeah, I think you're on mute, sir. Am I audible to you? Can you hear me? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. So I think now you're audible completely. Uh, shall I shall I start? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so uh, you know, I was wanting to uh, get us to hear the numbers first, right? And uh, you know, fifteenth March is when we first started tracking the numbers uh, from the state of Odisha, and today exactly it is uh, one month. So fifteenth of March, the number of countries infected were one hundred and fifty-three. and today the number of countries infected are 210 plus two ships on the high seas one month ago in this 153 countries 157000 people were infected 157 today that number is 20 lakhs okay so in 30 days from 1.5 lakhs roughly we have gone to 20 lakhs one month back the number of people who had died were was 5839 and as of this morning that number is 126738 people who have died the reason i am giving you these numbers is to first of all set the tone on what is the size of the problem and what is the problem i know you know people who are startup entrepreneurs people who are established entrepreneurs maybe on this call and in times like this our mind first goes to the idea of my business but i think the first thing to do is to look at the world's business not my business i'll tell you um 
two days back, my morning started with four pieces of news. The first piece of news came from a young man whose father was not given dialysis uh, in uh, several private hospitals because the man belongs to a minority community. So dialysis was not given to somebody who needs dialysis. And as a result, the man died. The second distress call came from a group of nuns, nuns uh, in a mission of charity, um, you know, um, home for the destitute and the dying, because that home is in a containment zone and doctors cannot go in there easily. And there's a destitute woman in her early 50s who uh, has stopped eating and stopped taking water. So the nuns don't know uh, how to intervene and what to do. And this uh, lady was actually rescued from a government hospital six or seven months back. The hospital could not do anything more. The third distress call actually came from a uh, you know, well-to-do person who was agitated because his 92-year-old father had fever for a few days and he called the uh, COVID helpline and the COVID helpline said, don't panic. So obviously when you have a 92-year-old father having fever, you panic. And as it persisted, they sent an ambulance to evacuate the 92-year-old father which now actually created huge panic in the family because if you take a 92 year old man in times like COVID, the first thing that may happen is you might quarantine that man. And, uh, you know, it breeds a certain acute helplessness. The fourth, came, fourth call came from people who are tracking distressed migrants. Today morning you would have seen or last night you would have seen the Times of India report of uh, migrant workers who suddenly came together in Bandra wanting in Mumbai to wanting to go home. The reason I'm telling you all these four instances is to make you make all of us understand that this is a time for human distress beyond business, beyond what opportunities might actually present itself. This is an unprecedented human distress for which there are two problems. One problem is there is no systemic memory. Every system to be able to deal with a crisis requires memory. So we have systemic memory of how to deal with war, for example. The country has gone through a number of wars. We have systemic memory of how to handle outbreak of violence in localized places. We have systemic memory of how to deal with epidemics, but we don't have systemic memory in independent India of how to deal with a pandemic. Memory is a very powerful vaccine and very powerful tool because man is designed to take decisions based on past experience. The second problem is just as there's no systemic memory, we also lack social memory. Let me explain to you why that is important and how powerful it is. After 1947, the entire generation that all of us are part of has had no experience of dealing with humanitarian crisis of this size. And when social memory does not exist, it becomes difficult to understand what is going on. And when you don't have power to understand what you are going through, the instant human response is distress, anger, fear, and a whole lot of negative emotions. Very interestingly, in the last one year, very, very coincidentally also, I happened to read uh, two books I will actually today talk about three books. So let me first talk to you about two books. The first book that I read was The Glass Palace by Amitabh Ghosh. 
the glass palace talks about how the british took over burma and in the wake of the second world war how millions of people went into distress and mass migration people walked all the way from rangoon to calcutta and along the way you know they were walking and everybody was dispossessed they had left behind their loved ones they left behind their life savings they have left behind their businesses and in complete distress in hunger and in sickness hordes of people started moving from burma across jungles very difficult jungles all the way to kolkata along the way wives would die and husbands would have no way to save them and would have to walk walk on children in mothers arms were dying because there was not enough milk so there was a huge amount of human distress and though amitabh ghosh has written the glass palace as a book of fiction it is actually based on a lot of historical fact so we do not have knowledge of something similar in independent india the second book that i was reading was a book called the pianist the pianist people who play piano pianist and this is a book by a polish uh, author called spilman and the pianist actually talks about the nazi occupation of poland and how it created chaos families got disintegrated people's lives were interrupted millions of people were put on a cattle train and sent to the gas chamber and basically the social support system broke down i want everybody on this call if you have the time to read these two books because these books bring us back the power to look at things in a larger perspective you know these are the times where everything has a risk of breaking down around us and that breakdown process actually creates a lot of difficulty for educated people people like you and me who have money who have some means of survival but in times like this if you let us say cannot buy bread but you have money you can't buy milk but you have money what will you do with that money so when that kind of a situation happens people middle class people actually become very upset and very angry because entitlement is breaking down money gives a certain entitlement and entitlement breaks down whereas poor people are able to deal with these situations with a lot more stoicism lot more resilience and lot more power because they don't respond with the entitlement breakdown syndrome in a situation like today i think as human beings we need to talk first as human beings later on as entrepreneurs startups msme or whatever it is in a situation like today as human beings we must do three things number one we have to accept the reality we can't be in denial you'll be very surprised how much we may be in denial and i'll give you an example of denial the example of denial is we deny the numbers i just told you the numbers from 157000 we are in 20 lakh so we have to accept that there's a crisis it is not somebody else it is us when we say that in india the numbers are small that's an example of denial because what gives us the guarantee that the virus will have a different trajectory in india compared to others we say that oh we are a country that had malaria so we have resilience we say summer is coming in so virus will die that's denial okay we believe that in 4 weeks time 8 weeks time things will settle down and everything will become normal now that is denial we have to accept the fact that there is a large crisis number 1 
And number two, even as we come out of this crisis, life will not be the same again. Acceptance gives us resilience. The moment we accept that we have a problem, that is half the problem dealt with. Moment we bring out stories inside our head and begin to deny, we will be in for a lot of frustration. So step number one is accept that there's a crisis. Step number two, as human beings, we have to declutter the mind. There is way too many questions in every person's mind. What will happen? What will happen to my business? What will happen to my people? What will happen to my customers? What will happen to my family? The truth is that the truth will dawn when something will, something will touch you in a personal sense. I gave you those four examples, real examples. I can guarantee that 99% on this call have not had a personal brush with a negative situation with COVID-99 yet. So when you are that person who is calling a helpline and you have your 92-year-old father, that is where the reality hits you. Or you are in search of dialysis and people are saying, no, we are closed, we can't help you. That is where the reality will hurt, it will, will hurt and it will hit us. So today, the time has come for us to declutter the mind and ask ourselves, what is important to me? Is my business important? Is my profitability important? Is the next round of funding that is now in doldrum important? Or is it more important that I emerge in good health and good spirit out of this? Who is more important to me? Is my popularity important today? Or is the smile of a loved one important today? Is my fear of the crisis, you know, thousands of miles away more important? Or is my spending a little more time that, than usual with my old parents more important? So get the fundamentals clear in your head. The third thing as a human being, I will tell you, is stay calm. You know, it is easier said than done. Even I have difficulty staying calm, but we all have to stay calm, particularly because we don't know the size of the enemy. We don't know the size of the damage that is going to come. And we don't know the amount of time it will take. So one is the size of the enemy. The other is the consequence, both direct and indirect. And the other is over what period of time. So when you have this kind of a situation, which is volatile, which is complex, which is, you know, uncertain and ambiguous, that famous terminology about VUCA, where we are basically in not only uncertain times, we do not know answers to most questions. The only thing in our hand is the power to stay calm. So these are the three things as a human being I have to uh, take into account. Now, let me actually shift to entrepreneurship. When I was coming here, I was asking myself, so what are the kind of things with my limited experience that I can share with you? Remember again, that even me, the only example that comes anywhere close, but miles away actually, is the experience of dealing with 9-11. This mind tree at that time was two years old and, uh, you know, 90% of our business was coming from the United States. I was there myself when 9-11 happened. I used to look after, uh, you know, the U.S. operations of mind tree, but it was a localized problem. It was not a global problem. It was just United States, some countries in the Middle East, and yet that crisis actually was a huge crisis because we were a startup. Second thing that was, uh, that was common to the present times is nobody knew the outcomes. The third thing is that even if it was a localized problem, the impact, economic impact of 9-11 actually took four years for us to come back to normal. 
I'm deliberately telling you this so that you appreciate that this is not a few weeks or few months. The economic implications will be so huge that it will take many years before we don't go back to normal, but we will be actually in a different place. So in that context, I will tell you a set of uh, 11 things today. The first thing I'll tell you is you have to lead with sacrifice. This is a time for sacrifice, personal sacrifice, organizational sacrifice, but you need to be seen to be sacrificing by your own people, by your own customers, by your own suppliers. And these sacrifices should not be symbolic, but they need to be substantial. When uh, we started Mindtree uh, in 1999, all of us were well-paid people, all the founders, and uh, we took uh, salary cuts between 25% and 50%. Because we said that a startup, when you raise somebody else's money, you need to respect money, and we can't pay ourselves the way we were paying ourselves earlier. But the moment 9-11 happened, we took further, deeper salary cuts, and the founders took the highest amount of salary cut, which meant completely resizing our own lifestyle. And this had to be at a level where people will actually say, oh my God, you know, so this is real, and this individual is really making a personal sacrifice. Because when you see your parents make a sacrifice in your family, then the children, will come forward to make their own sacrifices. So number one, you have to lead with sacrifice. Number two, in times of crisis, a leader's job is to continuously communicate. And I, I, I salute STPI for starting this series, which is all about communication. So you need to communicate continuously. Communicate with your people, communicate with your customers, and communicate with your suppliers. Communicate with the smallest person in your organization. In communicating, there are three subtexts to it, sub elements to it. Number one, to communicate, you have to listen. You have to listen to the stated voice and the unstated voice. There's a stated voice and there's an unstated voice. If you don't listen and you communicate, then people in difficult times, they become very deaf. They actually discount things. They don't, there is information overload. And as a result, there's attention deficiency. Only when we listen, we can talk to people with empathy. This is a time for empathy. This is not a time for data. So number one, you have to listen. Number two, you have to speak. You have to speak with empathy. You have to speak with humanity. People can find enough data out there, which is on the web and on the WhatsApp. So you need to talk as a real human being. This is not a time for management speak. The third thing, and this is the difficult thing when leaders communicate, we have to have the honesty to say, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Because nobody has all the answers. And as you speak to your own people, as you speak to your customers and suppliers, you have to be able to say, I don't know, I will find out. For example, a very common question would be, how long is this going to be, to, how long is this crisis going to last? The truth is, I don't know. If somebody asks me, when will the second round funding come in? I don't know. Nobody can say that. When somebody asks, so what will happen three months from now? So today you have not had a salary cut. Okay. Today you have not had a, you know, resizing of certain priorities. The answer is you don't know. But when you know, you owe it to your people to tell first. Your people should not no from second-hand sources. So first I told you, lead with sacrifice. 
not symbolic but substantive sacrifice. The second is you have to communicate continuously. The third thing is you please rewrite your business plan. The business plan with which you had started, and some people start with no business plan, you have to throw it away. Whether you are a small company, you are a medium sized or a large company, you have to completely rewrite your business plan. And don't rewrite it based on your own fancy. Rewrite it in an outside in manner. Accept the new reality. Look at all the possibilities that may eventually present themselves. And rethink. Now, it is easier said than done. So I started a company, let us say, a year back. And I made a fantastic app. It's a different story that it was a solution that was discovered before you discovered a problem. And you think that it is the world's, you know, world's uh, uh, privilege to actually use your app. And in the post COVID era, that app may have zero relevance. So don't be in love with what you had done in the past. Don't be in love with the business model that you had, but you think about what will the world need going forward. So when you rewrite your business plan, you question every single thing about your business, the way it is organized today. And be ready in a month time, two month time, three month time to actually put a reset button. The fourth thing I'll tell you is don't follow the herd. In times of difficulty, everybody follows the herd. Give me, you know, I'll give you an example. So another company is downsizing. So, you know, should I be downsizing? Another company is actually throwing things away out of the window. So should I also throw things away out of the window? Now, this is a time where a leader must make her own decision. When you make your own decision, you are more likely to stay with that decision. Don't just you know, get carried away by the fact that 20 other people are doing this. So am I being foolish about not doing it? If you don't want to lay off, don't lay off. If you don't want to, you know, close down an office 300, uh, you know, 300 miles away or 3000 miles away, don't close that office down. Do what you think you will support as a leader, as a human being, and don't follow the herd. The fourth thing is about the job of a leader. In a time like today, the leader's job is not to consume information. The leader's job is to do what I call sense making. People have all the information they need. And as I told you earlier, when you have an you know, information overload, you have attention deficiency. So as a leader, is your morning starting with following COVID data, which you are tracking through the day and picking up COVID information from all over the world and looking at WhatsApp COVID um, information, COVID jokes, and are you going to bed with that? Which is very different. How much COVID information will you actually consume? But more than the information, people are looking up to you as a sense maker. A sense maker's job is very different. A sense maker periodically needs to take a helicopter view of the situation. A sense maker's primary job is not to look at the small picture, but to look at the big picture. Be the sense maker. Your parents were your sense maker. When you were four years old and you had chicken pox, your mother put her hand on your on your forehead and say, you will be all right. In 14 days, you'll be all right. You know, this is what will happen. I had chicken pox and this is how I actually dealt with it when I was a child. So she was the sense maker. When you had your first setback as a, as a teenager, academically or in sports, your father came or your mother came and they did sense making for you. 
so this is a time not to consume information it is time to be the sense maker to your people the sixth thing i want to tell you is this is the time to pick up the phone and talk to your customer and talk to your supplier and ask them what could you do to alleviate their pain this is a time when everybody is thinking about your own pain your organization your own future if you were to pick up the phone and talk to a customer today and talk to a supplier today and say these are difficult times everybody is going through difficulty i have my own limitations but tell me is there one thing that i can do for you personally that will make it different for you let me guarantee to you that 10 years 20 years 30 years from now this gesture will be remembered and people will pay you back many times over the seventh thing i would like to tell you is please cut your costs to the core core means the core it is a time to actually imagine that you will be in zero state the money will run out okay this is not the time for you to say you know for you to justify what cost you should retain and what cost you should not retain imagine that the worst has already happened so the companies who will save the money for 30 days versus the company who will save the money for 180 days will determine you know who will come out of this summer or this winter as more more available to the world more capable to the world so please be ruthless when it comes to managing your cost and cutting down your cost the eighth thing that i will tell you is please deeply question your relevance ask yourself a hard question what will happen if my company didn't exist will the world miss it moment you actually question your relevance then you will be able to detach yourself from the symbolic stuff and shift to the substantive stuff you know it is a time for us to question the relevance of our products our services our offerings our technologies only when we will question their relevance in the today in in today's world that we will be able to come out with solutions that the real world needs about which i'll talk to you in a quick moment the ninth thing that i will tell you is when you are dealing with the frustrations dealing with the unstated anxieties dealing with the many difficulties that your people are facing through it is a good thing to seek external help don't try to be the only sense maker to your people you'll be surprised how many people are out there who can help you to come and not only extend their help to you as a leader but to your people and let me give you a personal example when 911 happened within the weeks of 911 new jersey was called the widow capital of united states of america most widows in that time frame actually came from new jersey state because people used to commute from new jersey to the world trade center now every day i would walk into the office i could sense that there was like a smoke inside the office you know you could feel it even if you couldn't see it not one week was going by that my people you know were not attending a funeral okay and the funerals after 911 was very long drawn because the dna tests had not been done somebody had an you know small finger somebody had a piece of cloth so how do you know out of the thousands of people who died who is who so only when the authorities were very clear that they would declare somebody as dead and that is when a funeral could happen 
So for months and months, the funerals happening and each funeral pulled down the spirit of the office. A time came when I actually went and sought help from outside. And I spoke to a professor in New York University uh, whose name was Raghu Garud. And I requested Dr. Garud to come and talk to my people. And what Dr. Garud did was he talked to my leadership team and he walked them through a real case study of a air crash that took place in 1972 when a football team from Uruguay okay, was moving in a chartered plane to go to Chile where they were to play a match and the plane crashed high up in, um, in the Andes. And uh, many people died in that plane crash. And the survivors, actually the, the crash uh, was, you know, the, the, uh, the effort to track down the survivors, if at all, was called off after eight days because of difficult situation, difficult conditions high up in the mountains. And some people survived without food, water in, you know, high up in the mountains in very difficult weather conditions and walked their way back. 16 of them were finally, they came back to, uh, to, to, to civilization after 72 days. But in this process, a couple of things happened. In this process, there was death all around, there was injury. There were two medical students who actually tended to the dying, the dead, and those who had to survive. And there was no food out there. So, so much so that there was a pact between the survivors that whoever will die, okay, will it is okay for other people to eat the flesh. So some of the survivors actually had to eat human flesh. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because when you, when you get to know about these difficult situations, you continuously compare with where you are today. This particular air crash that took place is called the Flight 571. And subsequently, one of the survivors actually wrote the story of survival. And uh, this book is called The Miracle of the Andes. Miracle of the Andes. And I strongly advise, just as I told about those two other books called The Pianist and The Glass Palace, every leader should read this book because this book is not just about survival. Through those 72 day period, Different people with different skill set in the team took positions of leadership. So leadership actually shifted from one set of people to another set of people to another set of people. In times of prolonged difficulty, there has to be distributed leadership. Organizations that will have distributed leadership will be the organizations will be able to see things through. But more than that, you know, the whole case study of the Air Force Flight 571, as it is known, or the miracle of the Andes, it gave a very different perspective to my leadership team and gave us a new confidence, a new set of sense-making tools with which to deal with the crisis. The tenth point I would like to make to you is that you should never miss a crisis. Every crisis has got an opportunity. And leaders must embrace crisis as an opportunity so that you maintain your positivism and you are able to, through that crisis, able to create a newer bonding. You are able to create newer closeness. So crisis is a time when character comes to the fore. Crisis is the time which makes families born. Even today, every family everywhere in the world talks about how two generations back, three generations back, three generations back, people dealt with crisis and they wear it like a badge of honor. So even today in the United States of America, people will tell you how three generations back, their 
you know, their ancestors came and how they were quarantined in the Ellis Island and how they had nothing and they started life all over again. Two, in India, people are still alive who can tell you what happened in partition. So when we go through periods of crisis, we actually bond better. People don't bond in good times. They think they're bonding, but actually they're not bonding. People bond in difficult times. So don't miss a crisis. Last point that I would like to make, which is my 11th point, is know that new opportunities will come. But those new opportunities will not be an extension of your old business plan or old idea. What those new opportunities are, we will know as time goes by. But it is very clear that there will be huge opportunity in the world of healthcare. Anything to do with healthcare. I think no government today will come into power if you don't have healthcare as your number one priority. Healthcare budgets as your number one budget. No longer international greatness, glory, power play is going to be important. You know, today a British prime minister can get Corona. You know, President Trump is up to his neck dealing with Corona issues. Of course, our Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, is continuously now seized as are the leadership of, you know, different Indian states. As to what is really important for your people. No glory, no global glory, no hegemony, no greatness today is more important than people's health. So health-related things will be rediscovered, realigned, refunded. The second is agriculture. For the first time in our entire generation, we are understanding the meaning of food because food is going off the shelf of the stores. Why food is important? How much food is important? So food is going to be here. Health and food are going to be here. You know, streaming video may or may not be important. What you watch online, you know, on the internet may or may not be important. Entertainment may or may not be important. Okay. But health and food will be more important than ever before. The third is supply chain. We now realize how important it is. So day before yesterday in our state, we basically lifted certain restrictions. And the first restriction that we lifted was on door-to-door -door delivery. We talked about the Zomatas of the world and the Amazons of the world. And, uh, you know, it is supply chain. If supply chain breaks down, everything breaks down. So anything that will improve supply chain is going to be even more important than ever before. The next area of importance is disaster. You know, we have enterprise resource packages. How many disaster resource packages are there? If you are able to come out with a Salesforce equivalent or an SAP equivalent or an Oracle equivalent of how to handle large scale crisis, you'll be in business. And of course, many people have different approaches to this. People are every day sending me dozens of mails about this app and that app and this analytic tool and that analytic tool. No, that's not what the world will need. The world will need a complete end-to-end -end solution. And we need to think about opportunities on how we will handle disaster going forward. Now, the other interesting thing that will emerge, we all talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about Internet of Things. We talk about robotics. We talk about drones. How do we actually combine everything for handling of massification? Handling of massification. How do you actually bring all these things together when you are dealing with masses? Okay. You would have seen uh, the kind of crisis that is unfolding. Like the suddenly you have a million people congregate in one place. How do you use technology to deal with that massification? So the, the crowd control that, you know, becomes an important issue 
as people come to a place like Bandra, breaking the uh, you know lockdown and suddenly emerge there. You know, you can't deal with a situation like that with force. So similarly, there's a massive amount of exodus that takes place from one place to another place. A plane has landed with 500 people and within seconds, you will have to deploy technology by which you will segregate people. Now, those are examples, few examples of how do you build technology to deal with mass of humanity, massification. So I could go on and on, and the idea is not to give you business ideas, but all I'm telling you is that as and when the world will be normal, a new normal, there'll be newer kind of opportunities, and we have to align ourselves, because the job of the world is to carry on. The job of the world is not to stay where it was when we left it back. But in all these things, I'm going to conclude by saying that you need to look at four real things. You need to look at real customers, not because you make an app and you want that some customer somewhere will use this app. But, you know, will your aunt use this app? So your aunt is the real customer. Your spouse is a real customer. Your neighbor is a real customer. So you can't look at a solution before you have looked at a problem. You can, of course, there's no law against it, but that solution will actually work where there's a real customer. The second thing is you have to solve real problems, not imaginary problems. The third thing is it better be a real solution, not a piece of the solution. The fourth thing is real money. So you need to look at real customers, real problems of real customers. You have to deliver a real solution for a real problem of a real customer. And finally, that real customer should be able to pay you with real money. So real customer, real problem, real solution, and real money. So keep focus on that. And I'm sure that all of us will come out of this one way or the other. And uh, we must brace for a future in which, as entrepreneurs, our job is to make the world a better place, a different place, make our customers, suppliers, and our people more successful than they have ever been. And this is a time for principal leadership, this is a time for humanity before just looking at the bottom line and the P&L statement. With that, thank you again for having me here with you today. Uh, God bless, good luck, and may you stay safe and may you stay healthy. So thank you, thank you, sir. A very, very, uh, I think, inspiring, uh, you know, thoughts, uh, you know, from you. And I'm sure, you know, your 12-point uh, agenda, especially, you know, all the 13, 13 points which was talk, talking on, speaking on, real customers, real problem, real solutions, and real money is is, is really uh, motivating for a lot of our uh, you know, listeners today. Uh, we are, uh, you know, almost uh, 650 plus people are listening to you. So, uh, you know, before uh, we uh, go open uh, with respect to certain questions uh, from audience, uh, I think uh, what I will quickly check with, you know, uh, we, I now request, you know, our audience to ask questions. Uh, the way you can ask questions is just raise your hand. And as soon as you raise your hand, uh, uh, we will give an opportunity for asking a question. Wait for your video and audio to appear. And once your video and audio appears, please ask your questions in, 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 in uh, you know, brief. And then uh, we will try to have answers uh, ready. So I give the floor open now. So, so, so uh, Subodh, before you uh, get to the questions, I must uh, first of all apologize for taking so much time. Uh, I do have to go back to my real COVID work now. So let's take about two or three questions. And please tell people to send the questions by mail to you. And that will give us a lot of insight into what people are thinking about. And I can even, you know, uh, come back again, or I can give you answers the way that I look at it. So let the questions come in on email even after the talk. And right now, let's take about two or three questions, please. So sure, sure. 
let's broadcast his email address, right? So yeah. that uh, we can. I, yeah, we I, will. I, I am. Uh, I am told that uh, the number of viewers are seven hundred eighty-one. That's good. So I think we will uh, quickly, uh, so, you know, take two or three questions. Uh, so I'll ask uh, the host if you can connect two or three questions. Uh, okay. So one question I think I have taken down, uh, which came from you know chat window, was uh, you know, I think uh, yeah. So we have you know audience now. Uh, question yeah. So, So, uh, so whoever has gotten access uh, can ask a question or we will switch to someone else. Uh, I think we are facing some difficulties in getting us. Uh, if you are, yeah, if you are able to con see, then ask a question. Uh, I think Shrikant. Okay, we. I think our director uh, Sanjay Jagi ji. I think we are facing some difficulty in. You know, yeah. You can yes. read the questions and I then uh, question, let him reply. Yeah, so I think question has to come. Yeah, I think we can uh, probably, Shrikant, uh, we can yeah. get from you. Yeah, we can, can I get from you? you? He's audible. Yeah, Shrikant. He's audible. Yeah, yeah uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Bakshi, it's an honor and privilege to listen to you. I read your book in 2008 and it led to me starting my first company. I'm on my second company right now. I owe a debt of gratitude to you for your book and my heartfelt uh, uh, thanks to you. Uh, I have a very simple question, sir. Uh, I have a very young startup at this point of time and we had drawn out a hiring plan for the rest of the year uh, uh, before this crisis, about three, four months back. Uh, what, uh, how should we look at our hiring plan at this point of time? What kind of discount factor should we apply to our growth uh, projections and how do we go about uh, uh, thinking about our growth projections and our business plan uh, taking into uh, consideration the COVID impact? I am in the fintech sector, if that helps. Yeah, so Srikant, thank you so much. I think that's a great question. Uh, let me ask you one question before I sure. answer. In sure, your sir. hiring plan, how many people were you think about thinking about hiring? Uh, by the end of the year, we were planning to go grow our team from 5 to 15. It's not a huge plan, but still, it's a, it's a, for, for a very small company, it's a big, you know, uh, uh, growth. 5 to 15? Correct. Okay. So, ask yourself what would happen if you were to make it from 5 to 7. Okay. You know, that's a good starting point because I was telling you earlier, you have to declutter your head and decluttering means asking, you know, what will happen if we, you know, cut off everything? What will happen if we actually did only this much? Okay. okay. So the, the, the thing is, if you were to hire 15 people and you are in FinTech and FinTech will be, FinTech will be hit very hard. Let's have okay. no confusion about that because countries will actually become bankrupt in, in the way that you know this whole thing is unfolding. And look at the COVID numbers. The number tell you that the United States, countries like US, countries like you know China will actually countries you know uh, which uh, you know supply the fodder to the global economy, they will all be hurt big time. So that has got a cascading impact. And if I'm in the fintech business, I will actually ask myself, so even if it is not 15, and even if it is not 10, if it is five for the next six months, and then we'll add two more people, then what will happen? Yes, you will slow down your growth from you know X to maybe one fifth of X. But doesn't matter. Right now, it is a question of behaving like a squirrel 
in winter or behaving like a bear in winter. We have to tell ourselves that hibernation is important. Longer an animal hibernates, higher is the possibility of that animal continuing. So it is a time for hibernation. In hibernation, you cut everything down. It's just you and you breathe and you sleep. So this is a time for hibernation. This is not a time for growth of any kind. Yeah, I think uh, he heard your question. I think answers, uh, though I think we had to cut him off right now. Uh, so I, any more questions we have from audience? Uh, I think so. We, uh, uh, we, yeah, we have one more. Uh, yeah, challenging. Good afternoon. Namaste to you, sir. To you, sir. And, uh, I thank you for you know sharing your valuable time for giving us such an inspiring and motivating talk today. Sir, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask one question to you. That beside this, uh, you know, health uh, care uh, sector, what about the travel and hospitality sector? Because uh, uh, this sector accounts for nearly 4% of the combined, you know, uh, um, IT BPM revenue in this country. So, because the mid tier companies, they will be, the companies will be hit hard in this uh, COVID era. So, what <coughs> we have to take? To cope up with this situation that is my question sir. no it's a very good question and i'll give you the headline travel and uh, hospitality will be hit very hard and it will take a long time to come back the reason for that is very simple you know i have uh, on my on my screen saver you know uh, because i use a windows system uh, the uh, Windows uh, system keeps showing me nice pictures of uh, holiday destinations. Okay, and there was a time until COVID happened that I always used to tell my wife, "Look at this. We want to go here. We want to go here." Okay, but today, where will you go? Which place is a safe destination? Which place you are guaranteed that you will not have a secondary infection of some kind? So. I do not think that in 6 to 12 months time, people will feel confident about taking vacations. So I think if I'm in the hotel and hospitality, um, you know, hospitality sector, uh, it is not going to be an easy uh, option now. People will travel less, people will holiday less. Um, of course, people have short memories also. So at some point in time, you know, people will say, what the hell, if I'm a newly married person, I will go on a honeymoon. Young people will do what they need to do. But that said, I think uh, it is safe to uh, safe to think that this is a sector which will take a long time to come back. But that's my personal opinion. Sure. Sure, sir. And again, go back to that point I was making. You know, in times of crisis, people pull back and say, ask themselves a simple question. Is this important? Is my traveling important? Is my using this additional app important? So get into their head and find out what is not important for people. If it is not important for people, go for it. So I think just one or two more questions. One question, sir. Last question. If you have time. I to If you don't mind, I really need to go. <laughs> okay, uh, sure, sir. But only one question. Sir, DJ, sir, you are on mute right now. Uh, sir, uh, yeah. So may I ask a question quickly? Uh, being an industry leader, you have already seen the 9-11 uh, you know, crisis before the IT industry and then uh, the Lehman Brothers uh, financial institutions collapsed. So you have already witnessed all these uh, challenges before the IT industry. What do you think is that uh, uh, this uh, challenge, this pandemic would uh, uh, create and cause? And how do you think the core C is situation for IT industry, how it will emerge, what kind of uh, impact it will have on the job losses or revenue? What kind of, you know, your account, your visualization about the problem after this pandemic is over? 
and what the stakeholders are required. So, Umtakji, I will go back again, and I'm my sincere request to people because you have more time on your hand now. You are at homes. Um, please read those three books. Please read the Glass Palace. Please read the Pianist, and please read Miracle in the Andes. Then you will understand what questions to ask and what questions not to ask yourself at this point in time. You will get your own answers. You don't need to get the answers from me. So please read those three books. And coming specifically to the IT industry, I will sign off by saying that life will continue. People will eat. People will build families. There will be a new necessity for organizations to think about how to handle disaster and crisis. So as long as there's a then as long as life is there on the planet, IT will be needed. IT will not be needed the way we, we actually thought about it. It will be needed in different ways. So as long as people can be adaptive, people can be sensitive, people will be more humane in terms of the applications that they build, there will be opportunities. How long it take, I do not know. So, once again, you know, right now, right this moment, it is not IT and it is not business. It is life, it is society, it is all of us surviving this ordeal together as a family. So, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to all the questions. Which is thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you to both. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll end the session now. Thank you.